This is the second part of the 1.09 lesson, less than equal. Okay, we were in the midst of the reading in the textbook, so we're going to finish that up. Um, we had just finished this section, and we'll start with African Americans in the North, but before that, I'm going to read this excerpt here about Ida B. Wells. Ida B. Wells was born in 1862, the child of slaves in Mississippi. When she was 16, her parents died in an epidemic of yellow fever. To support her brothers and sisters, Ida Wells taught at a country schoolhouse. She continued teaching when she moved to Memphis, Tennessee. There in 1891, she joined a newspaper called Free Speech. The next year, when three black, black grocers, whom Wells knew as friends, were lynched in Memphis, she used her newspaper to start a campaign against lynching. Angry whites responded by ransacking her office. In print and in lectures, Wells continued her campaign against lynching. She showed that most victims were not criminals, and that some, like the grocers lynched in Memphis, were prosperous blacks who threatened white business interests. In 1895, Wells married a Chicago lawyer and editor, Ferdinand L. Barnett, and thereafter went by the name of Wells Barnett. In Chicago, she worked with Jane Addams to oppose the establishment of segregated schools in the city. Wells Barnett also worked to secure the vote for women and help organize African American women to take on various reform causes. African Americans in the North For some black Southerners, conditions at home became so intolerable that the only solution was to leave. The Negro loves the South, said one Mississippian, but he does not love the white man's South. Here's a picture. Jim Crow regulated most African Americans to the least desirable neighborhoods, like this tenement row in Washington, D.C. Many blacks who wanted to leave found it hard to do so. The train fare was well beyond the reach of most southern blacks. White landowners often sent armed policemen to discourage would-be migrants to nearby train station. Nonetheless, by the turn of the century, a steadily increasing stream of African Americans was flowing north. During the second decade of the 20th century, about half a million of African Americans headed from the south to northern cities like Chicago, Cleveland, Detroit, and New York, beginning the long northward movement of blacks known as the Great Migration. Jim Crow in the North. Black people lived in the North since colonial times, but in relatively small numbers. Even in the North, most African Americans lived in the least desirable neighborhoods and held low-paying jobs. As more newcomers arrived from the South, African Americans in the North found themselves on a collision course with their white neighbors. White workers feared economic competition from blacks who might work for lower wages. When white workers went on strike, factory owners often hired black workers as strike breakers. In consequence, consequence, many white unions barred African Americans from membership, which created a racial rift in the American workforce. Many white Northerners shared the same racial prejudice that flourished in the South. In 1908, in Springfield, Illinois, mob violence broke out when a white woman claimed to have been attacked by a black man. Although the woman later confessed her claim was false, it was too late. An enraged white mob lynched two black men and turned its fury on the state capital's small African American community, destroying shops, burning homes, and brutally attacking black residents. In Detroit, Michigan, in 1925, angry whites screaming, Get them! Get them! attacked the home of Dr. Ashen Sweet, a noted black physician, when he and his family moved into what had been an all-white neighborhood. In the first decades of the 20th century, Jim Crow laws and practices also became common in the North. In New York and Chicago, African Americans found themselves barred from dining in white-owned restaurants. Many Northern colleges and universities had once welcomed black students, now turned them away. African Americans also found themselves subject to ridicule and caricature. Newspapers, magazines, and films portrayed blacks as ignorant, childlike, and lazy. Popular household brands like Aunt Jemima Syrup used images of black servants to peddle their products, reinforcing the notion that African Americans belonged in a position subservient to whites. Such imagery made it easier for white people to look down on African Americans and accept Jim Crow practices. Life Left Out of the World's Fair in 1893, at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, while Americans celebrated the promise of modern urban life, some observers noted that the fair's white city was white in more ways than one, not just because of the gleaming buildings, but also because the exhibits made no mention of the history or achievements of African Americans. Ida B. Wells edited and contributed to a booklet titled The Reason Why the Colored American is Not in the World's Columbian Ex Exposition with articles by Frederick Douglass and Wells' husband-to-be, Ferdinand Barnett. Douglas noted that the Americans are great and magnanimous people, and this great exposition adds greatly to their honor and renown, but in the pride of their success, they have cause for shame as well as for glory. New Leaders in the Struggle for Racial Equality 
In the late 1800s and into the early 1900s, many Americans, as part of the progressive reform movement, worked to address social problems. These reformers came, from, came mostly from the white middle class, and their efforts did not directly address the racial crisis facing African Americans. As African Americans saw their political rights whittled away, and as Jim Crow pressures intensified, three black leaders emerged, each with a distinctive approach to achieving equality. Although Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, and Marcus Garvey all responded differently to the crisis facing black Americans in the late 19th century and early 20th centuries, they all shared a passionate commitment to racial progress and helped black Americans find their way through bleak and trying times. Booker T. Washington. And this is a picture of Booker T. Washington here. Booker Teleferio Washington was born into slavery in the remote hill country of southwestern Virginia. Emancipated, freed, at the close of the Civil War, he worked as a coal miner and then as a house servant. He went on to become one of the most powerful and influential African American leaders of all time. Making his way to Hampton Institute in Virginia, a prominent black vocational school in the South, Washington first considered a career in law or the ministry, but he chose education instead. In 1881, he founded the Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute, located in rural Alabama. Tuskegee's program differed from those offered at most white colleges. The institute focused on self-help and job training. Training African-American students to become tailors, dairy farmers, and mechanics gave them a practical way to escape the sharecropper's plight. Washington proved to be a skilled fundraiser, and by the time of his death in 1915, Tuskegee was a thriving, well-financed educational institution with 1,500 students. In 1895, Washington delivered a speech to the Cotton States in International Ex exhibition in Atlanta, Georgia. He was the only African American speaker invited to address the mostly white audience. In his Atlanta exposition address, Washington declared that African Americans wanted economic opportunity more than social equality. The wisest among my race, he said, Understand that the agitation of questions in social equality is extremist folly. The opportunity to earn a dollar in a factory just now is worth indefinitely more than the opportunity to spend a dollar in an opera house. Washington invites patience and hard work and seemed to accept segregation as long as blacks were not denied access to good jobs and a chance at self-improvement. Washington's speech, soon known as the Atlanta Compromise, earned praise from white leaders. From that moment on, Booker T. Washington became the best-known black leader in America. He was invited to give lectures around the country. He established a National Negro Business League to support African Americans in their efforts to start and develop businesses. In 1901, the year he published his best-selling autobiography, Of From Slavery, he dined with President Theodore Roosevelt at the White House. Regarded as a voice of moderation, Washington was widely praised in the white press. He also enjoyed the support of many black Southerners who admired his ability to act as an ambassador to white political and business communities. Out of the spotlight, however, there was another Booker T. Washington, one who secretly funded civil rights lawsuits, including those aimed at challenging the grandfather clause and other measures that restricted voting rights. While he publicly argued that blacks should accept their inferior social position, Washington worked behind the scenes to advance their civic equality. At a time when blacks were facing almost unbearable challenges, Booker T. Washington provided them with a per powerful image of dignity and success. Nevertheless, as years passed and little seemed to improve, many black Americans grew impatient with Washington's seeming acceptance of segregation, and they urged more active steps to secure their civil rights. And at the top here is a picture. The Tuskegee Institute focused on self-help and job training. Here, black students work in the Institute's wheelwright shop. W.E.B. Du Bois. Before Booker T. Washington died in 1915, he saw his message of moderation and patience challenged by young black leaders who believed the full equality could not wait. None of them would have a greater impact than a scholar, activist, writer, and editor named William Edward Burghardt Du Bois. Born and raised in western Massachusetts, where few black families lived, W.E.B. Du Bois was in many ways Washington's opposite. He was an intellectual, refined, and stiff in demeanor. He became the first African American to earn a doctorate at Harvard. The author of more than 20 books, Du Bois felt most at home among college faculty, rather than in rural black churches. In his best-known work, a 1903 collection of essays titled The Souls of Black Folk, Du Bois asserted that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, the, rel the relation of the darker to the light races. 
Within the African American experience, Du Bois observed a sense of tension and division. He described how one ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings. The African American, said Du Bois, simply wishes to make it possible for a man to be both a Negro and an American, without being cursed and spit upon by his fellows, without having the doors of opportunity closed roughly in his face. In The Souls of Black Folk, Du Bois directly challenged Booker T. Washington. According to Du Bois, Mr. Washington represents a Negro thought the old attitude of adjustment and submission. Du Bois asked whether it is possible for African Americans to make effective programs on, in economic lines that are deprived of political rights. The answer, as he said, is an emphatic no. Du Bois opposed Washington's focus on industrial training for blacks as too narrow. How then, Du Bois asked, shall the leaders of a struggling people be trained in the hands of the risen few strengthened? There can be but one answer. The best and most capable of their youth must be schooled in the colleges and universities of the land. Du Bois argued that this talented tenth of highly educated blacks must lead the race out of second-class citizenship into the economic and political equality. In 1905, Du Bois challenged Washington's leadership by helping organize a meeting of African-American leaders and thinkers at Niagara Falls, Ontario, Canada. The meeting launched the Niagara Movement, which called for an immediate end to Jim Crow practices and an end to restriction on voting rights. In contrast to what Du Bois had called Washington's attitude of adjustment and submission, the Niagara Movement issued a manifesto saying, We claim for ourselves every single right that belongs to a freeborn American, political, civil, and social, and until we get these rights, we will never cease to protest and assail the ears of America. Weakened by a lack of organization and funds, the Niagara Movement never quite took off. But in 1909, Du Bois and other members of the Niagara Movement joined a group of black and white activists to form the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, which soon became the nation's leading civil rights organization. A year later, Du Bois became editor-in-chief on the NAACP's magazine, The Crisis. The NAACP campaigned against lynching and undertook legal actions to secure the rights of African Americans under the 14th and 15th Amendments. Marcus Garvey In the spring of 1917, the United States entered World War I, the subject of an upcoming chapter in this book. With the nation's attention focused on the global conflict, Du Bois urged black Americans to support the war effort and set their grievances aside until victory was at hand. In the summer of 1917, however, riots erupted in East St. Louis, and white mobs killed more than 40 African American men, women, and children. To protest this and other acts of racial violence, the NAACP organized a silent protest parade. More than 8,000 African Americans marched down Fifth Avenue in New York City in a peaceful and orderly fashion, carrying signs with messages like, Thou shalt not kill, and race prejudice is the offspring of ignorance and the mother of lynching. W.E.B. Du Bois visited East St. Louis and wrote about the riots in the NAACP's The Crisis. Another voice also spoke out against the riots, proclaiming them a crime against the laws of humanity, a crime against the laws of the nation, a crime against nature, and a crime against the God of all mankind. These angry words were spoken by a new black leader, Marcus Garvey, a Jamaican immigrant who had arrived in New York in 1916. Garvey held a vision for African Americans and for black people worldwide that differed greatly from the ideas of both Washington and Du Bois. Garvey believed that reconciliation with whites was impossible. He urged blacks to build up their own communities and plan for a new future separate from white world, the white world. His organization, the United Negro Improvement Association, UNI, UNIA, stressed the need for black-owned businesses and social institutions. Garvey himself undertook a number of business ventures, including the Black Star Line, a steamship company that aimed to promote trade between black communities in the United States, the Caribbean, and Africa. Garvey found a receptive audience in both the rural south and urban north. By some estimates, the UNIA, at its height during the 1920s, had more than half a million members, making the largest mass movement in African American history. The UNIA members donned elaborate uniforms and held parades to boost enthusiasm. Racial pride was a key to the UNI UNIA's appeal. To be a Negro is no disgrace but an honor, Garvey wrote, and we of the UNIA do not want to become white. Garvey's vision was one of separation from, not inclusion in, American society. At one UNIA convention, Ar Garvey, Garvey argued, Garvey urged blacks to leave America and establish their own republic in Africa. He called for the social and political separation of all peoples to the extent that they promote their own ideals and civiliz civilization. 
Garvey's separatist message was opposed by Du Bois and other black leaders. 